Welcome to another exciting Bible study with Reverend Dr. James A. Duncan, pastor of Shiloh Baptist Church. Faith study in the Word is designed to keep you fired up about your walk with the Lord. Fired up about our faith study in the Word with Pastor Duncan, author, teacher, and long-term educator with a burning desire to see every believer live a full life of faith in the redeeming power of God. This can only happen when we develop a hunger and thirst for studying the Word, God's Word. Thanks for joining us in tonight's study. Hello, this is Pastor Duncans. I am here in our Port Norris location, and I have some great news for you. You know, I, I don't know why God does this. Well, and then again, I do know why God does this, but I just started my series in the Psalms when all of a sudden, you know, I believe that the Word of God needs to be relevant, that the Word of God needs to make sense, that the Word of God needs to reflect the needs of the people. And even though I love the Psalms, right in the middle of the Psalms, God now has me doing a switch. I need you to tune in Wednesday night. You don't want to miss this. Here's what I want to say to you. What about if these are the good old days? What about if things don't get any better? Are these the last days? What about if they never find a cure? More people die. Uh, no cures in sight right now. What about if the food supply and the chains where we get our resources fall apart and supermarkets doesn't have anything and jobs go, continue to go and the economy breaks and falls. I'm going to say this. What I'm telling you is God told me to do a message, a series entitled How to Survive, How to Be Victorious in This Pandemic, How to Live Tough during this pandemic. I want to talk to you about the prophetic nature of the days we're living in and how you can produce a quality life under that pressure. Look, all I want you to do is tune in to this new series. You'll see one of our commercials. And I'm telling you, this is something straight from the heart of God. We will find out prophetically where we are in the Bible and where we are in our heart and where we are as far as God keeping us as believers. Tune in. Don't forget, living tough in the pandemic. God bless you. This is Pastor Duncan. I'll see you Wednesday night. Welcome back. This is Pastor Duncan's, and I have an exciting study for you. Kind of scary. Uh, all I will tell you is this is not the time to have weak faith. This is not the time that we're living in to be a weak Christian. This teaching, this message that I'm going to talk about the next few weeks came straight from the Holy Spirit and you need to hear it. You need to hear what God is saying. I guess you saw uh, my little commercial where I said I was preaching through the Psalms and I was happy and I was doing what God said and all of a sudden the anointing hit me about understanding eschatology or the end time things. I've been asked a lot of times from a lot of people, is this the end time? Are we living in the last days? If you want to know what the Bible says about the end times, about the last days, how it correlates to what we're doing now, how the prophecies are fitting in, grab you a seat and listen to the word of God. Let me tell you how God speaks. I was on my way to church and I decided to stop into a Wawa. And as I was going in, uh, I saw two ladies coming in the Wawa on the, uh, through the other door, the other side doors that I wasn't coming in. But their conversation was so loud. One lady said, oh, I forgot my mask. And then she commenced to pulling her shirt up over her face. And her friend said, girl, cut that out. I got another mask in the car. So she went back to the car, got her mask. And she walked up to her friend. By this time, we were all at the coffee bar. She said, this must be the last time. These must be the last days. Look at all these people with these masks on. Well, because I'm kind of known around here, uh, they spied me. I'm trying to get my coffee, minding my own business. And one of them said to me, uh, Pastor Duncan. And I looked over there and said, tell her we're living in the last days. And, you know, they caught me off guard. I said, well, if it's not the last days, we're getting close. 
And then I walked up to the register, and as they walked to the register, they got behind me. One of them said, girl, it's not the last days because your crazy butt forgot your mask. And she said, I'm telling you right now, this is the last days. Even Stevie Wonder could see this is the last days. That's what I'm going to be talking about. Because I got in my car, and as I was setting my coffee down, I looked around at the guys pumping gas with the mask on. I saw people walking in, grabbing different color masks. Then I started thinking, man, this is an episode out of the Twilight Zone. What's going on? And I heard myself saying, it's getting closer. So to your benefit and mine, that's what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about, are we living in the last days? Think about it. Now, I'm going to put a biblical understanding on it, but are these the last days? Come on, we're living in an unprecedented time. This pandemic is a a uh, worldwide pandemic. Yes, there's been other pandemics, but no pandemic has shut down the world. The world has been shut down. God has a plan. And right now, all of science, everything man's doing is not helping it. Now, I'm not going to sit here today like some you know prophets do and tell you I know everything. Because the second thing I'll tell you is nobody knows for sure if we're living in the last days. They just don't know. You know how we don't know? Because the Bible tells us very clearly in Matthew 24, 36, that no man knows the day or the hour when God is coming back. So I'm not making a prediction. I'm not going to give a prediction on this test, on this class. But what I need you to do is understand you will have a biblical connection to what God is doing and what God is saying. I started off by telling you, you can't have weak faith living now. And you can't have a weak faith and walk around here and not know you're being challenged mentally and emotionally. And you're, you're being challenged in a way that we've never been challenged before. And we have to have wisdom, but we also need to know what God is doing. I like what the prophet Amos says. He said, God never does anything without first telling his prophets. So now God has prophetically kind of ushered me to lead in this direction. And I'm going to give you what I got. It is not a big class on eschatology, but it is a big class on us understanding at least getting some bearings on where we are. And I guess the most scariest thing is, how, do, how can I say this is the last time? Well, think about something. The coronavirus. I just talked about it. But what about what could happen with this virus right now? Uh, Florida, Texas, they're in all-time highs. Other states are having a surge. But that's not the part I want to talk about because I'm not CNN, I'm not Fox News, I'm not trying to give you that. What I want to tell you is think about something that could this, these times we're living in now, here's the question, because I saw an article that was looking at this, could this be the good old days? Pastor, you must be kidding. What I'm saying is, is this as good as it gets? What about if right now we go downhill and enter into the book of Revelation, enter into the last times. What about if these, we look back and say, wow, uh, all we were searching for was toilet paper before. All we were searching for was this. How about if this is as good as it gets? Because things are kind of crazy right now. What could happen? What could happen? Let's look at it. Well, first of all, there are no vaccines even though the trials are continuing. I looked today and I saw where they were having a hearing uh, in Washington about that. And all of our top scientists, that's something else. All of our top scientists can't figure out what's going on with this virus. I mean, we have, uh, we have think tanks all around the world and they can't figure out what's going on with this virus. And so what about the vaccine that we're looking for that everybody's talking about does not come. What are, what are you saying, Pastor? What about if deaths continue? Florida had a record high. What about if people just keep dying? It's not unfathomable because there are still people out there. I'm not siding on mask or no mask. I'm going to put mine on. I had a Christian walk up to me and say, hey, we're covered. 
And you know, they want to give me a big hug. I say, ho, 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 listen, I am covered by my mask. All I'm saying, guys, is we got to have some wisdom. But what about if the deaths keep happening? And right now, families are having a hard time to mourn anyway. What about if now, talking about the good old days, we are talking about where can I buy a mask? And I saw on TV, they're actually designing masks for women to go with their outfits. But what about if the virus gets so bad that we don't have masks, but we need hazmat suits covered from head to toe? I'm just saying what could happen. What about if the economy keeps worsening? Think about something. If trade stops, unemployment, 10 million Americans have applied for unemployment. Governments are losing. Where's the money going to keep coming from? What about if the money just keeps on disappearing, jobs keep closing up? Wait a minute. That means if jobs keep closing up, we may have some resources and food supply. You think it's something looking for what you're looking for now? What about if the shelves are empty? Why? Because the countries you used to trade from and they would trade for us, uh, not even talking about the trade agreements that's been messed up already, you know, by our present administration. But what about if you go to look for the common stuff? There is no food. And when there's no food, the markets start collapsing. So maybe it could run into our pension, God forbid, our social security, all those folks on fixed income, all those folks looking for it, all that money you turned in. What about, there's no rules now. You never thought you'd be sitting out here walking around with a mask on, walking around in quarantine. We're like living in a sci-fi movie. What makes you think it can't get worse? So I'm just giving you some what ifs. And what about right in the middle, which normally happens, other strains of the virus show up. Wow, we're trying to get this strain taken care of, and right in the middle of that, another strain shows up. I wanna talk about how just my what ifs, what could happen, figure into a biblical understanding of the last time. What I need you to know is there are several major passages in scripture that tell us about the end time, all of them coming together. There is, I have to tell you, more than any other time in the world, there is more correlation between what's happening now and what's in the Bible than any other time. I'm doing this so you can be prepared and understand that you have to learn how to live tough you have to learn how to handle the pressure. You have to understand where you are, and you can't do that in ignorance. At least look at what's going on. I had some people, you know, I've been pastoring a while and looking at some people. They can't talk about death. Uh, if someone dies close to them, if you mention a name, they go, ooh, I don't want to talk about it. And all I'm saying is until you face it, you can't get over it. Until we at least face the possibility that these could be the good old days, that maybe food shortages, money shortages, unemployment run out, major collapse of market, maybe that's real. But what does the Bible say? Let's take a look. There are several passages on the end time. Now, I'm not gonna sit here and try to read all these passages, but I want you to know that the one that we're gonna be focusing on is Matthew 24. Grab your Bible. Matthew 24 is when Jesus' disciples came to him and they was talking about the temple perishing in Matthew 24. And it's a great end time passage called the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse. In the Olivet Discourse, Olivet Discourse, Jesus talks about some of the things that shall happen in the end time. Now, here is something that's even more biblical, not a coincidence. Every other passage that I'm about to show you line up with the Olivet Discourse. We have Isaiah 13. There are exactly, when you look at it, seven signs that are harmonious, even though each one of these passages talk about a different angle and aspect of the end time. Man, God is cool. There are seven signs that I want you to be aware of that lets you know we are living in the last time. Ezekiel 38, um, Zechariah 12, all of these verses, Zechariah 14, Jeremiah 4, Joel 2, and Joel 3. 
all of these verses. Now, I'm not going to get into reading all those scriptures, but I, will, I, I want you to know those passages or I want you to look at those passages on your own free time. I'll just leave that there while I talk. Seven signs are in the Olivet Discourse, seven major signs. There's all kind of people trying to make predictions and talking about things. But what I'm saying to you is there are seven signs that we need to be aware of that happened in Matthew 24, that happened in uh, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Zechariah, and Joel. Let's talk about those times. So what did I tell you? Each passage contains seven signs that indicate we are living in the last days. Um, and I want you to listen because you can see these signs as we go along and you'll understand that, yeah, that's what's happening. So what the Bible tells us in Matthew 24, first, there's going to be an occurrence of all sorts of disasters. All right, we're talking about Katrina, we're talking about the tsunami, we're talking about the earthquake that just happened in California yesterday. We're talking about the way the rain, the, the heat wave, the unnatural heat wave that we're in right now. But it talks out wars and rumors of wars, pestilence. It talks about all the things we're going into and the coronavirus fits this occurrence of disasters. You want to tell me what a disaster is? A disaster is right now people losing their lives from a virus that with all of our medical expertise we cannot fix. Now think about something. Um, I read that you know they've learned different symptoms each week with this thing but I just found out that there was a 28 year old who contact, contracted the disease the coronavirus and had to have a double lung transplant yep we found out that people are dying don't care what color you are don't care what uh nationality don't care what nationality don't care your wealth what you know how how you're living in society living large living small doesn't care if you're a doctor what your profession is the coronavirus is an equal opportunity killer and all of us need to be careful who would have thought you know, now, even with just during this time, the recordings that we make, when you walk into my church, you have to take your temperature, uh, you have to write down that you came in, who you were in here with for contact tracing, because that's how deadly the virus is. So first of all, one of the signs is, and that's why I guess the girl said this must be the end, is there would be all kinds of occurrences of different things. The love of believers shall grow cold. It's talking about the fact that there are many believers now who have a form of godliness, uh, but we've gotten into a world where we have to be tolerant of what's going on. I'm not saying that we should not be tolerant. I'm saying that as a believer, we still need to love everyone, but we need to make sure we hold on to our beliefs. Nobody respects you if you don't hold on to your belief. So the love of believers, meaning that even before this pandemic, be honest, churches were losing members, people were dropping off. The love that's growing cold is not just the love for each other, but growing cold for God. They leave God out every day. They, uh, in a message I was preaching, uh, looking at a different perspective of Lazarus and uh, Mary and Martha, I thought about something that Jesus said when they said they believed in Jesus, but when Jesus approached them, they said, if you'd have came, my brother wouldn't have died. That right there shows an unbelief. Unbelief says, if you would have been here. Jesus said, don't you believe that even now, can somebody say even now, even now, God can fix what's going on. See, people don't have that old time. Listen, when I was growing up, there was folk that would get down on their knees on what we call the morning bench. They would pray until something happens. They trusted God. Our forefathers did not make it through the times they lived through being squeamish. They made it through on nothing but their faith. And now we got believers that don't even show the kind of love that they can even build God's kingdom. A lot of things are suffering in God's kingdom because we don't have believers who understand their gifts, their destiny, 
that it's better to be with God. We, we want God to work on our terms. So one of the other signs is, and you can see it, the church slowly, the love for God is growing cold. As a matter of fact, uh, we call it in theology when you have people loving all kinds of of religions they're sitting out there and say there's no there's no religion better than any other religion that's called pluralism pluralism says if you worship satan you're just as and the world says you're just as authentic as someone who works with jesus christ if you are a christian they're just saying anything that can get a 501c3 religious document and say they are a church that we are to believe in them. And if you talk to folk, they will tell you, what makes your religion any better than anybody else's? That's because they never, ever, ever tried God. I'm sitting here as a witness right now, and I know there's some other people, they look at us as Bible thumpers, they look at us as walking around, you know, trying to, we're not pushing something because we want to. How many of you know that God did a B&E on me? He, he broke into my life. I wasn't looking for him. God somehow said, I chose you in the midst of everything, and I I dare you, I double D dare you to find another religion that has lifted people and changed people's heart, lifted them out of so many problems as touch, one touch from Jesus Christ. Won't happen. Anytime someone takes a good look at Christ, something happens in their life. We love God not because we're so lovely. How many know I love God because, because he first loved me? And nobody understands that until you get that touch yourself. Um, there's a story about this great orator who would go around and he would go to Christian churches. He was an atheist and he would tell Christians, <coughs> uh, I come to speak so I can share with you and show you how there is no God. And all of a sudden he started going to most churches by the time he stood up and spoke. He had taken all the spunk out of them. He talked so eloquently. He was such a great orator. He put so many scientific facts down to the average Christian to our shame could not defend their faith. And then he'd get done and he'd stand up and say, any questions? And he had covered all the bases. Well, there was this one old man standing in the back of the church, wrinkled suit, not looking too good. But he raised his hand and said, I got a question. And all of a sudden, this, this, this orator looked at the condition, the outward appearance of this bum trying to question me. And he said, bring that old man up here. And the bum did something that is so fantastic. He pulled out a brown paper bag. And he took the brown paper bag and he pulled out an orange. And as he walked down the church aisle, he peeled the orange. Oh, the order was getting upset. He looked at him and said, bring that fool up here now. And when they brought him closer, he got done eating his last slice of orange and he and licked his fingers. And the orator was hot by now. He said, ask your question and hurry about it. And the old man looked up and said, well, you say that there is no God. You say there is no such thing as Jesus as my Savior. That's right. That's right. You can't prove there's a God. He said, well, that orange I just ate, was it sweet or sour? He's a sweet or sour. How do I know? I didn't taste that orange. He said, and that's the problem. You never tasted my Jesus either. The scripture says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. See, the question is, if you never had God in your life, if you never tasted of his mercy, come on now, tasted of his grace. If you never tasted of his forgiveness, if you're the kind of saint like me that needs grace and forgiveness all the time, and you never tasted it, if you've tried every other thing, and then God was the one who came along. Come on, where the folk used to smoke, used to go out and drink. You did everything you could do. But when you got one taste of the goodness of Jesus Christ, you found out how good he was. Where was I? And I was talking about that there was going to be the love of believers wax cold. Wax cold. Then there was, in May of 1948, and you can look this up historically, there was the reestablishment 
of Israel. And Jesus said before his return, as one of the signs, Israel will be established. They got their, their, got their embassy back. Israel was recognized around the whole world and organized in 1948. Celestial phenomena have appeared. This just means strange things happening uh, around us in the skies, around us on the planet. If I were to go and show you all the strange phenomena that's happening right now, animals doing what they normally don't do, um, nature doing what it normally doesn't do. I had someone ask me the other day, said, I was actually looking at some trees and the trees in the heat of this summer look like the leaves were in fall foliage. The leaves should have been green and bustling, but the leaves look like they were turning an autumn color. That just means that we're living in a time that you can't tell the seasons, which is a biblical prophecy. The gospel shall be preached. Oh, let me go back. The gospel shall be preached all over the world. The gospel shall be preached. I like that because right now, even, you know, us, uh, Shiloh Baptist Church, one church in two locations, we reach a lot of folk. But with the uh, technology, even with this pandemic, we found out we can reach more people. The gospel is all over the world. The devil is doing his best to try to squash the God. Come on, think about it. They try to squash the gospel message. They try to make anything holy look like it's silly. They try to take anything God has and turn it around. We're living in an upside down world. I don't have a problem with who loves who, but when you get into the idea of marriage that came out of scripture, you need to know that the world is saying, we're gonna have marriage on our terms. And all I know is at the end of the day, because of my belief system, you're gonna to have to answer to God. I, I believe God loves don't, don't, somebody needs to hear me when I say this. God loves gay folk. God loves trans folk. God loves everybody because God is the God of love. But everyone God loves also needs to realize that God is also going to be the final judge. Don't listen to church folk. Church folk are just as sinful as anybody else, so don't let anybody judge you. But I need you to know, at the end of the day, it is not us. You're, it's like I'm just delivering the mail. You can't get mad at me, the mailman. Take your dog off my leg. It's not me. It's the belief that the Bible is saying that you have to answer to God, not to the church, not to a preacher. Don't get mad at church folk, but we know it's going to happen. But the reality is, at the end of the day, and uh, I have, it was so funny because I had a couple of people who were actually saying that um, they were uh, homosexual, they were gay, they came to the church, they listened to Bible study, and there was a young lady who came in and she was with another young lady. I know I'm about to get some mail now, but listen to me. She came into the church, and all I'm saying is, I don't know where you got your uh, degree or your halo on your head from. All I know is when these people came to our church, they listened to the word of God that I preach and they decided to join the church. And I remember my deacons came in and we had, a, they wanted to have a pastor. We got to talk about this. You let, how gay folk gonna accept Jesus Christ? So I said, well, look guys, all I know is they decided they want God in their heart and you need to understand all of us are God's servants. Now listen to me. That means that if they decide they want God, it sure is not Satan drawing them. It sure is not an evil spirit. I always tell people when you're out there trying to judge somebody who's saved and who's not, I need you to know God is working in people's hearts long before we do. So the only reason they can, they must have had something working in their heart to raise their hands. But I appeased them and I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to have a meeting with them. And I tell you, I sat in and I asked the young lady who had her own way of looking at her sexuality. I asked her, well, you know, you know, the word of God says this and this. Why do you want God? I said, uh, you want to be baptized? She said, yes. I said, well, what's going on? Here's what she said. I'm searching. Wow. I'm, I'm, I, I want to find out more about God. If you, the church, turned me away, where can I go to find that out? 
Now, church folk, you can say what you want and you get on your holy high horse about everything, but Jesus Christ never turned anybody away and I did not either. Because you know what? I baptized a whole lot of heterosexual devils mm -hmm, who got out the pool and was just as bad as they were when they got in. This young lady, when she told me that, it was the end of story because she said, I'm searching for God. Now, you can condemn people if you want. I'm just letting you know that I just saw an authenticity about this person's search for God. And I sure was. I'm sure too afraid of God to try to shed that off. Anyhow, the gospel will be preached all over. Next thing that shall happen is there'll be appearance of false Christ. Um, there is, I, I could talk about this in a manner that you understand some people calling themselves God uh, their own God, false Christ. It just means that there's people running around now with a false message about Christ. I'm not going to get into it, but there's been a whole lot of perpetrators out there who are just in the gospel, the good news, in religion, just to make a buck as a scam. And there's a lot of false people that have led, that have led a lot of people astray. The emergence of heresy, that's the big one. Heresies is there's a whole set of doctrines that come out that are not connected to the Bible, and we don't know that they're that the people who are doing it don't even believe that they're heretics. They have just evolved to a certain position, and they try to say that the, what we've been holding on to, what the gospel clearly says, that what we've been holding on to is a, uh, what do you call it, is um, old school. You know, like we've evolved to a point that we want more knowledge. So what we've done is place knowledge, which is scriptural, we place knowledge ahead of the time proven truths of the word of God and we dress it in the decorum our, of our education and our degrees. Now listen to me, I have not wanted, I didn't order my doctorate, I have an earned doctorate from a reputable institution and I have studied, I have all these, I have a lot of degrees, but that's not my point. My point is no knowledge is higher than the knowledge of God. Some things that I can expound to that will help me function in the world, but will not get me closer to my Savior. Some things I can agree with, I can assent to mentally. I can believe somehow this is what's going on, and I can even make excuses for it. I can even show you why it should be. But all I'm doing now is doing what other folk have done, and I'm taking the knowledge that I have, and I'm bringing forth a heresy. A heresy is when the doctrine goes against what the Word of God does say. Now, I'm not talking about symbolic Word of God. I'm not talking about us just comparing portions of Scripture. I'm talking about literal promises of God. That, okay, you don't believe me? There's people out there now preaching. Now, some people say, I wouldn't do this. They're saying, there is no hell. I mean, there are respected preachers that I love saying, my God would not send anybody to hell. I believe that statement. God does not send anybody to hell. But sure enough, in the Bible, he describes that you can go to hell by neglecting the gospel when it is preached to you. Uh, they, they say there's only one unforgivable sin, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. I know someone told you blaspheming the Holy Spirit is not cussing at the Holy Spirit. It's not stumping your feet down. It's not being evil and mean. No, there's a whole lot of Christians that God would throw away if that was the case. Blasphemy in the Holy Spirit is when God sets out to show you his love, to give you access to himself, to open a door and say, here it is. This is the way to salvation. And you turn your back on God. You blaspheme the Holy Spirit most of the time because if you get in trouble, uh, we are so two-faced, so double-minded, so hypocritical that we'll ask people to pray till we get back on our feet. And then we'll go around and do our thing again. So I need you to know that right now there is a lot of heretical doctrine out there. So with those seven signs, let's look at the sequence 
of the last times. They only went in depth a little bit into the signs, but this sequence into the end times, you want to know. Sequence mean is how is it going to happen? What's going to happen? Now, I need to tell you, I'm going to look at this sequence of the end time from a biblical perspective, but from what we call a pre-tribulation viewpoint. There is post-trib, pre-trib, and mid-trib, and I'm going to look at it from a pre-tribulation. We believe eschatologically that pre-tribulation, meaning that there's going to be a period of tribulation that hits the earth. That's part of my what if this could be kind of statement. You know, at one time I thought, how in the world is there going to be a mark of the beast? How is somebody going to need a special stamp to get food? Well, keep living. You never thought you need a mask either. So let's look at this sequence of the end times. Now, the tribulation period is actually um, seven, a seven year period of time when God will finish uh Seven year period of time when God will finish his discipline of Israel. Um, what it means is the tribulation period is when that end time happens. God's going to finish not only his discipline of his chosen people, but it will be a period of time when the whole earth will go through major tribulation. But when we look at it scripturally, um, the, the orientation of it is what God had prophesied through his prophets that he will finally discipline it for what? Rejection of the Messiah and other things that we know if you read the Old Testament that they actually did not choose God. But let's look at the tribulation in respect to what a pre-trib view is. So pre-trib says that, um, and we have scripture, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 9, says that Christians will not be present during the tribulation period. Now, understand that everyone does not believe in the rapture. The rapture is the catching away or the snatching away of all the believers. And everybody, even all theologians, have different viewpoints on the uh, rapture, where the Christians are going to be. I just believe there is so much evidence. This is my understanding of scripture, my teaching and understanding what I learned in scripture. I just believe God says too many times that he is about delivering his people and not allowing us to go through. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 9 gives you a, a scripture that pre-trib is based on. It says God has not appointed us to wrath. This is when Paul was preaching to the Thessalonian church, letting them know they had all kind of doctrines in there about what was going to happen to the dead and what was going to happen to their relative that was dead. And all Paul was trying to tell them is God has not appointed us to wrath. I believe that's what salvation is about. How many out there watching me now know that if God was going to appoint us to wrath, there could be a whole lot he could be doing to us now. I love Hebrews 12 when it talks about God chastises his children. God whoops us. Okay, I like the word chastising, but as I said, old school growing up, we got beatings. And we didn't even call them beatings. We call them beatings. We got beatings when we were growing up. When you did something, your parents beat you Why? to straighten you out. God chastises for the same reason. So what God does, I believe, is chastise us, pour out some mercy, pour out some grace, chastises us so that we can line our life up with his word because he does not want us to see wrath. But even, be, even more than that, your understanding of salvation. I don't know what my, your understanding of salvation is and mine is, but there's a whole school out there saying you can lose your salvation and you know that, that, you, uh, that being saved is something you have to hold on to. Uh, and, I, and, and what's crazy about being saved to me, what's, what's crazy about that understanding is, um, what makes you so special that you want to keep your salvation, but I'm so evil, I want to throw mine away? See, in order for you to have a viewpoint that you're so holy, you think holy, you walk holy, that everything you've done is all right, that there's no way you could lose your salvation, but other people can. That's very judgmental. And I've run into a lot of saints 
And they do it because they need to still be under the law or they need to think they have something to do with salvation. I beg to differ. It is salvation is by grace. It is a gift of God and not of works, lest anybody think they were the ones who got their own salvation. Everything you need to know is salvation. Reason you should praise God that you're saved is because I love that song by the wine. Is, Millions didn't make it, but I was one of the ones who did. Meaning I've claimed salvation, which takes me into eternity. So think about what I'm saying. If I'm into eternity and you're into eternity, you got a lot of nerve to tell me, well, uh, I'm going to go out and sin and just throw Jesus away. You must not have heard what I said earlier. If I tasted of God, and just threw him away. It meant I really didn't have him to begin with. But if you taste of God and I taste of God and we know what God has done, how come you're so special, so cool, so dialed in that you don't throw your salvation away? But I'm just going to throw mine away and get out of here. I, I just don't hold to that notion. So I believe in pre-trib because I believe salvation was for past, present, and future. So if salvation is past, present, and future, why would God save me and make me then go through a tribulation? Now tell me what you want to tell me. Send in all of your doctrine if you want to. All I'm telling you is I just don't believe when I go through 66 books, it says my God is a deliverer. I guarantee you if folk could raise their hand on this medium, there's a whole lot of folk out there and say, yes, God delivers. He doesn't put us in bondage. He brings us out of bondage. I'm going to help somebody right now. If you go to a judgmental church, if you got a saint in your sphere of relationships who tells you that they're better than you, that somehow they're more holy than you, then you need to understand that's a need they have to put themselves above you. And it might just be telling that they're not what they say. Because when you got to wear a bumper sticker, or if you got to always prop, uh, post out and just share with everybody how holy you are, and I had visions, and who I speak in tongues, and I did this, and I watch healing. Anything you did, anything you experience, please remember the book of James. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights who is above. Listen, everything good that happened in our life, God did it. So hey, I'm going too long on pre-tribulation. But let's look at the other view so you'll know what it is. Then there is a mid-trib view. Now they use 2 Thessalonians uh, 2, 1 through 4 which says the rapture will not occur until after the Antichrist is revealed, they say. That's one interpretation. But what they're telling us is mid-trib says that uh, the Christians will go through part of the tribulation and then will be raptured out, which is kind of silly also. Post-trib says no, the rapture and the tribulation period are one event. They're one and the same. So, um, the rapture and the tribulation starts together, which you got to understand when they when they tell you this in the view, post trip says that um, the rapture and the return of Jesus, excuse me, is one event. So they're saying after the tribulation, when Jesus comes back for his second for his return, that that's when the tribulation uh, period will happen. So none of that is right. I'm going to go pre trip. All of you out there, got any sense? You're Petri with me. You believe God did not appoint us to wrath. God's going to save us. Let's look at a few of these tonight, then we'll move on. The first thing you need to understand the sequence. Write this down. Get some paper. Write this down so you understand what I'm saying. There will be the rapture of the church. First event. Now I need to share with you scripturally, biblically, Nothing else needs to happen for the church to be raptured. That's left to interpretation. Again, I'm not giving you a time element. All I'm saying is when you study prophecy, even if it's in whatever interpretation you look at, everything that prophecy covers, in some way you could literally uh, say or see that has occurred, have occurred, or is occurring now. So, the rapture, and you've seen the movies if you have not, and this is a scary thing. That's why if you're if you're laying in the bed and you wake up, uh, both of you are saying, 
and you wake up and your mate is gone and they didn't go to work or they didn't just go outside then and it's a strange feeling around it could mean that your mate has been raptured and you got to try to work it out down here listen to me god works by our heart the reason i'm telling you the rapture is first is because you'll be driving down the road there's going to be accidents can you imagine i get raptured me i know i'm getting raptured i know i'm getting raptured now know what you're going to do i'm going to be caught up to me him in there now you need to understand the reason the rapture is not christ's second coming because he never touched down on earth the bible says we'll be caught up to meet him in the air so this is just one of the sequences but it's not us actually uh, jesus not coming back he's just really coming back to take his church so that the i believe what the Bible says is so that tribulation period can start. We believed in him. We got saved. We get snatched out. But the rapture, can you imagine airplanes dropping out the sky? Uh, cars. I mean, just literally whatever you can think of. Somebody sitting in the dentist chair getting drilled on. The dentist leaves. And they're still sitting there with the drill dropping on their face. All I'm telling you is the rapture is going to be a real Situation. You want to write scripture down? Write the scripture down. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. The reason I tell you it's scary, it says, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the last trump, for the dead in Christ, the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up in the air to meet him. So understand, the graves will open up the dead folk who were saved will rise up those who died in christ then we who are alive will meet him in the air they'll go first then us and we'll ever be with the lord once we're gone the second thing that's going to happen is the rise of the antichrist second thessalonians 2 and 7 and 8 tell us about this it's when a satanically empowered man will come along and be very charismatic and this world you gotta imagine if the rapture happens it happens all over the world so all of a sudden airplanes didn't just fall in out of the sky in texas they fell out in italy they fell out in africa they fell out wherever you can name so the whole world now is in shock they said the antichrist is going to rise up and he is going to somehow gain power as he brings the world back together. Now, when I say this, when I talk about what could happen, that could have been a fairy tale until we got into this world, where we are in the world right now. Come on, I'm not the only one. Wrong is right, right is wrong. You know, the world is in a reckoning right now that there's been so many decades of where we have in, in ignored the history of this country when it comes to racism, second class citizenship, and just how African Americans were treated. That it's, it's, it's been like we've had story after story, decade after decade of all this inequality and, and all of this discrimination, and it, it became so systemic that it was just a part of our growing up. It was just a part of our life. Um, we knew as black people that you, when, when, a, when a police officer got behind you, you knew you, you stiffened up. It's like your pulse rate went up. It's because there had been so much injustice between the police and African Americans because it was drilled into the system of our country. Think about what I'm telling you. There's not an African American man or woman that doesn't know what it feels like to have eyes on you and if you reach any statue in your profession to have resentment from someone looking at you and just because of the color of your skin so there's been a lot of that and all of a sudden it's almost scary that the world is in a reckoning when i see everybody running around hollering black lives matter people paid for that folk died for that but when you see white black uh, biracial, all folk running around saying they understand now the significance of Black Lives Matter means that there has been so much recorded history of uh, unjust treatment of African Americans that people just 
swallowed like it was nothing. I saw pictures of hangings down south where people would bring picnic baskets for a lynching and they sit there and when you look at the pictures, they're pointing to somebody's son, somebody's father, some black man or woman that they lynched and castrated. And we go around singing America, the free, all of that's good. But what I'm telling you is, I don't know why God allows injustice, but I'm telling you there's a reckoning coming right now. And I believe it's part of these end times. There is, a, there is something that has come to pass where people are standing up. So whenever there's a reckoning, there is the status quo, there is the revolution that comes, and then there is some sort of battle, some sort of conflict. All I'm saying is these protests and this emerging group of young leaders, these protests and these folk that are running around saying, no, we need equality. And please understand me, there has always been white, black, all races, the nationalities of people who were in the fight for freedom for black people. I didn't say everybody, but there's always been uh, blacks and, and Jews alliance. There's always been white folks, not all of them, but I'm telling you, there's always been, if you look at major civil rights movement, major, um, when, you, when you talk about the Underground Railroad, there was always under people. And I don't want to get off track, but I'm just saying to you, think about what we're saying. I'm telling you that this rapture, this antichrist can come about because the world is getting skewed to such a point now of division that once he rises up, there's going to be an acceptance of the antichrist. Now, I don't know if I share with you um, the scripture and it says, and then shall the wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. So it's talking about the prophecy of how the antichrist was going to end. So we have the rapture, then the antichrist, and then we believe the seven years tribulation period will start. Now you gotta remember, man is going to try to bring um, something order out of God creating disorder or bringing divine order through prophecy. Man's going to try to, as we always have, they're going to try to now impose their knowledge and their will on organizing. This is when I believe that's when they're going to kick God out because you know they're going to have this Christian theory that, you know, some people are going to say aliens came. Where do all people go? So there's going to be so much hatred for God that that's when there will be the mark of the beast. You know, we literally say 666. All I know is this, is there will be some sort of denying God just to exist. It may not happen right away during the tribulation, but God is going to be challenged because you see, watch me, this man was satanically empowered. So this is nothing but an extension of Satan's futile efforts to try to destroy God's kingdom even at this late point. It's something. So when this, when the tribulation period starts, it's when God starts pouring out judgment and all kind of, when you go back and read the book of Revelation, you can correlate the bold judgments and the trump. You can correlate all the judgments in Revelation to what's happening during the tribulation period. In the battle of Gog and Magog. Now this is talked about in Ezekiel chapter 38. So we got the rapture of the church, we got the Antichrist appearing. We got the tribulation. Then there's a battle. What that means is there's going to be alliances that form all over the world from the Middle East, uh, Africa, other countries who align themselves with this Antichrist. And what's going to happen is this alliance that comes in, they want to attack Israel or God's chosen people. And here is when we see not the first, but a big sign. God's going to supernaturally from heaven come down and stop that attack. Wow. All these countries are going to get together to attack God's chosen people. It just sounds like to me what God does now. 
Whenever there is an all-out assault on us, God protects us. I'm talking to somebody now. God is protecting you. Remember Psalms 191, one of my favorite. He who dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my fortress. All I know is when you abide in God, He will come to your rescue. Remember Elisha and his servants? When the king sent men after Elisha because they thought that Elisha was sharing with his enemies when an attack was going to come. And Elisha's servant looked out and said, they're attacking, there's armies everywhere. And then Elisha asked God to open his eyes. That's all I'm saying to you right now. Open your eyes. God will never leave you like you are. God's going to protect you and bring you out. He said, open his eyes. And when he opened his eyes, he saw angels like flaming swords standing around them. I always tell you there are more people with us. He that is with us is more than the whole world against us. After this happens in Ezekiel. Uh, Revelation 6.16 talks about tribulation. The battle of Og and Magog, I told you, was in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. But it's when man's efforts to try to override something God said he would protect just did not work. Hallelujah. That's why you're still here, hon. When the doctor says no, when people go against you, remember you belong to God. That's why you didn't go under, sir. It's because at that time, God sent a spirit, an army to raise you up. If you look around your house now, if you look around the world now, the favor you have gotten from God is because of the fact, just like God did to protect Israel, he always protect those who belong to him. Then there's going to be the abomination of desolation. At midway point of the seven-year tribulation, the Antichrist, which he's going to do, shows his true colors. He wants all the power. He breaks a truce with the nations. And that's when there's going to be all the wars coming around the world. When the abomination of, of uh, uh, desolation is when the world is going to be desolate. And the world is going to find itself struggling to survive. Because halfway through the tribulation, the nice nice is gone. Not only the mark, but that's when people will be beheaded. And whatever, ever, dastardly way they can think of killing people. All it's saying is, I'll put it to you this way. Think about Satan being in charge. Wow. We who were raptured are still in glory with God. Look, you don't want to miss the rest of this teaching. I'm going to stop here tonight to share with you how I'm going to give you an understanding of the last times and then show you when we end up to the last times I'm going to give you the weapons biblically to live tough during this pandemic I'm going to show you how to handle the pressure that life is putting on you now I'm going to show you how to handle the struggles the internal struggles the mental struggles come on you don't have to fake the internal struggles I'm going to show you how the word of God can set you free Join me next week, living tough in the pandemic. Could this be our last days? This is Pastor Duncan saying God bless you, and I'll see you next week.